Good afternoon. How's everybody? Merry Christmas. Uh, we're going we're gonna to sing some carols tonight. Most all of you know them, I'm sure. Uh, words will be on the wall. But uh, let's just uh, celebrate Jesus' birth together. Let's stand together as we sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Merry Christmas. All right. Okay, it's a joke. You can laugh. You can laugh. It's all good. And I know that you're uh, laughing because I look like a preacher. I've heard that a few times today, which is good. I do own a tie. I do. This is it. The only one I got. I wore it just for you. I hope you guys are... Excited about Christmas. I know it's been a wild year, but, uh, you know, in interestingly enough, uh, we are closing the year remembering the birth of Jesus and getting ready right around the corner for the new year. And how fitting is that, that we end the calendar year remembering the birth of our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and getting ready to enter a new year with uh, new adventures New trials, new tribulation, I'm sure. Hopefully a lot of joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what we want to do today is we want to remember the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We certainly remember the bookends of his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we know that Jesus was born to die. And what a life that was that was credited to our account. And he uh, gives us the salvation, and he gets the glory, and we all say yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we love Christmas. We do love the presents. We love the tree, the smells, the uh, eggnog. Some of you love eggnog. Uh, you know, the lights, uh, all the coffee. You can't have Christmas without coffee. 
or whatever you drink in the morning, you know, hot tea, I don't know. And uh, we love all those things, but we really love Jesus Christ as Christ followers. And we pray your hearts are lifted up today in him. And we have a lot of folks represented here. We have actually other countries, other folks watching around the world live with us. Uh, we also uh, have uh, folks from Mississippi. That's okay. I'm from there. It's good. Mississippi folks. We got anybody from Arizona? I know who you are. I won't point you out, but Connie, good to see you. Uh, they moved here about a year ago. So glad to, glad to have folks from Arizona. Uh, we have some folks from California. You made it out. Good. Good deal. Uh, who else do we have? Arkansans? Yeah. A lot of Arkansans. There you go. Missouri? We got some Missourians. There you go. That's how we got. I was taught to say Missouri. Missouri instead of Missouri. And I said, I never heard Cincinnati pronounced Cincinnati. But, but Missouri, it works for Missouri. But uh, who, what, who what else? Who, you're Missouri. Yes, we have, we have another Missouri in here visiting grandparents. Very shy. Good, I could tell. I can tell. That's awesome. We're going to have the, exactly. We take Jack, so it's all good. <laughs> we, uh, we love you. We have folks all over watching and uh, praising the Lord with us. Welcome to those who are uh, at home. We pray <clears throat> that the live feed works well for you. Uh, let's get our hearts ready to uh, worship the Lord some more in song, and we'll hear uh, from the Word uh, a little bit later on and, uh, and, and get ready to go home to our family and friends, neighbors, and hopefully your hearts will be full uh, of the joy of the Lord after this. We had a great sermon this last week. Uh, from David Fleet, from Luke chapter 2, and uh, I'm going to go there as we read Luke chapter 2, <clears throat> the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is going to start in Luke 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, <clears throat> Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes <clears throat> and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth Peace among those with whom he is pleased. You know what? Let's do that right now. Kevin, go back to that verse. Let's say that together with the angels. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Amen. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, you can only imagine this, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, <clears throat> they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, that's Jesus, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And the name of Jesus means salvation. The Lord is our salvation. And so we praise the Lord for our salvation found in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue to remember his birth, his life, death, burial, and resurrection, his entire life credited to us tonight. All right, let's stand together. We'll continue to worship and sing these beautiful carols at Christmas. Oh, come all you faithful.
us of childhood things that happened, Lord, when we were growing up, and Lord, going, I remember going to uh, see the uh, manger and uh, around the church festivities and seeing the baby in the manger and just uh, realizing what Jesus actually did for us. And Lord, we thank you for the gift, the birth of Jesus and our salvation in him and Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, remember that during these this next two days, Lord, t- tonight and then again tomorrow as we uh, open gifts and give gifts and remember that Jesus was the ultimate gift and also the ultimate sacrifice for us. We thank you so much for what you did for us. and We praise you and we honor and glorify your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Every time we get together, uh, it's such a privilege and an honor to do that. You never know what the next week holds, and uh, so we're so grateful to be able to uh, physically and spiritually come together. And we always, when we come together, we always remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We always get into his word. Uh, we try to uh, preach and speak the truth in love. And, uh, you know, tonight is uh, no different. Uh, than than when we normally gather together, except for the fact that it's Christmas, and when we are literally on the eve of Christmas and getting ready to uh, be with family and friends and neighbors and coworkers possibly, and you have all the fun, food and fellowship. But let's just kind of be honest. We're we're pretty pretty blunt here. Uh, we believe that the the truth uh, shall set you free. And uh, you actually don't love someone unless you tell the truth. And so that's what we do here at City on Hill Church. 2020 has been rough, right? 2020 has been really, really rough. And uh, when I talk about speaking the truth in love, I just want to be honest, right? Um, Not all is merry and bright this last year. There have been people who have uh, become ill and passed away. There are people who have had major surgeries major concerns, major fear. I don't think in my lifetime I can remember the fear being as as serious and thick as it is. We've had a crazy uh, election year, still crazy. I think the crazy is going to keep going uh, into 2021. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to be to be joyful when not everything is merry and bright. You know, some some Christmases, you feel the burden and the weight of that more than others. You know, now some people have really strong personalities and some intestinal fortitude, and they can kind of white knuckle, grab the steering wheel, and just kind of plow through Christmas, plow through the pain, plow through 2020 as if nothing is really going on. They're happy, they're merry, they're fine. But then there are others who, when they just hear about joy, they hear about, you know, Christmas and and being merry and bright, it actually makes them uh, grumpy and uh, angry, and they're not very joyful. So for some of us in the church, this is a great season of joy and merriment. For others, it can make the sorrows feel more acute. It can make the pain feel often worse. It can be more painful during this time of year for some people. A normal life is hard enough. Add 2020 on top of that. Add a crazy election year on top of that. Add that horrible diagnosis 
add whatever you're going through, and it can often make it worse. And when you hear the bells or the singing and everybody's pretending to suddenly be merry, you want to take the bell and smack them with it. Uh, you know, right? we're, we, we're not so hap, hap, happy around here. We, uh, have you seen what's going on? The real Christmas, the real Christmas back there, back then, doesn't ignore your pain. The real Christmas doesn't ignore your pain. When you open up the Bible, as we did with Luke 2, and this is basically uh, what we're referencing here, uh, you know, when you open up the pages of Scripture and turn to that first Christmas, you know, we find without a doubt that not all was merry and bright. Not all was just wonderful. The, the new glimpses that we're getting here in the Scriptures, there was a dark backdrop. There was a really dark backdrop to that story uh, there with the birth of Jesus Christ. There was a lot of misery. There was a lot of disorder. Those first rays of brightness, it, it, it shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. But let's, make, make, let's tell the truth. It was dark. It was a rough time. For thousands of years, God's chosen people had waited they were waiting for the Messiah. They were eagerly waiting for him to arrive. And then God goes silent. God goes rogue. For 400 years, they don't hear anything, absolutely nothing. And they're wondering if their God is real, if their God is really the God of fulfilling these promises he made in days gone by. And for 400 years, it seemed as if he had gone completely silent until we hear him cry in a manger. Now think about that. When babies cry, they're hungry, they need a diaper change, or they want to be held. And I find incredible symbolism in that, and, and we don't want to stretch the truth too far, but the first time we hear God after the book of Malachi is when he cries in a manger. There's something powerful about that. There's something vulnerable about that where God understands your pain as he is incarnating himself, putting on flesh and dwelling among mankind like you and me so long ago. Let's first consider these two right here, Mary and Joseph. Let's consider Mary. Doubtless, she was excited about her firstborn child, but obviously quite confused. How does this happen? How, how did... This is crazy. This is a miracle. Miracle. I, I have great anticipation with the angel's announcement, but I also have a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. And soon she's going to be showing. Her belly is going to be showing. She's going to have to hide this pregnancy. She's betrothed, but she's unmarried. Soon all the watching eyes of Mountain Home, I mean Nazareth, all the watching eyes are going to be looking at her, and they're going to be whispering little judgments about her. Even three decades later, her own son's enemies, that's Jesus' enemies, in the book of John chapter 8, verse 41, are going to whisper and outright say the same things about him and his mother. So when Jesus outmaneuvers these guys, they're going to start saying things like this. We were not born of sexual immorality, but you were. From this moment forward, Mary is going to have to live with this supposed disgrace. Mary is going to have to live with this stigma. How deeply hurt, you know, she must have felt. She had this wonderful news. She was uh, expecting God in the flesh. I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing, actually, to think about. And then she's going to have to carry this stigma with her of the virgin birth the rest of her life. Now think about her husband. He had just found the woman of his dreams. He was betrothed to Mary. She was pure. She was chaste. She was a godly woman. There was great favor on her life by God. And then all of a sudden, Joseph finds out that his betrothed wife is pregnant. What is a man to do? 
he did not want to disgrace her, so he said he would privately divorce her in order to not disgrace her. But the angel of the Lord said, do not divorce her, for what she carries in her belly is the very son of God, and he marries her. He is going to have to live with the stigma of, of what she supposedly did in the night watches. There's this backdrop of pain, and yet we, we learn in Matthew 1 that Joseph, the son of David, takes Mary to be his wife because that which she conceived in her was from the Holy Spirit. Trusting the angel's word comforted his own soul. But I'm sure as a regular man, he had momentary lapses of weakness. Mary, are you sure you're not lying to me? Is there not some other guy in your life? Are you sure? I, this is so far-fetched. Trust me. We have to trust the angel. More significant than Joseph or Mary's pain, however, is the pain and sin and suffering and ruin for which Jesus came. The angel declared to uh, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So he had the normal relational problems with uh, Mary and Joseph with this incredible news. But then you had the normal backdrop of living in a sinful, fallen, broken world where people get sick, where you have terrible, corrupt elections, where people die from illness, where you get that terrible diagnosis, where you lose someone, you know, that you were not supposed to outlive. This is the backdrop. And every Jew agreed that God's people needed saving. They all knew that. We, we know we're messed up. We know we need help. And, and they thought they needed help and saving from Roman dominion over them. You know, Rome had the boot on their neck. And we're hearing a lot about that, you know, these days uh, on the news, right? About this group or that group having the boot on someone's neck. And they're crushing you with all that, you know, governmental weight or, or whatever, you know, crucible we're carrying right now. It was no different then. And the Jews were anticipating this Jesus, this Christ uh, who was going to come and, and overthrow Rome. He's going to take back the government. He's going to align everything and make it right. But the angel's announcement to Joseph did not even mention Rome. God's first covenant people indeed needed saving, but they needed saving from their own sins, from the darkness and the corruption in here, not out there. So you have that going on. Christmas doesn't ignore your pain. And then there's the humble little Bethlehem. And, uh, you know, David referenced this. I referenced this in my sermon. You know, Jesus was not born into a royal palace. He wasn't born with, with gold-plated, you know, trim bathrooms. He was not born with a marble palace, in a marble palace. He was born in a feeding trough, you know, most likely in a guest house or a guest room with, with total strangers all around them, except for Mary and Joseph. You know, the, the little area where they had to bring some animals in, it wasn't the best of places. It was actually humbling. And, and, and people would have said, can this really be the Christ? There's no place for this kid to put his head down. He doesn't have the nice little smocked outfits. He has swaddling clothes. You know, he doesn't have his initials, you know, J.C. on his shirt, Jesus Christ. He's in a manger. This is not fitting for a king. This is not fitting for someone like him. It was quite humbling. No politicians came to see him. We're seeing a lot of that. Boy, a lot of these politicians, they'll get on the news for that 15 seconds of fame. Uh, they'll get on there to pump up themselves. They'll get on there to make much of the, you know, their agenda or whatever they believe is best for this country. No politicians showed up for Jesus. No dignitaries. Shepherds. In fact, it took about two years 
for a group of astrologers, sky watchers to come see him, stargazers. You know, these aren't the cream of the crop folks that you would have at the birth of the king of kings and lord of lords, you know. When, when, a, when a king is born overseas, they roll out the red carpet. They get all prettied up for a picture. They get the gold-plated trim on everything. They give him the best of the best. He's got this incredible endowment. And he gets, he, she, they, the parents, they get all this airtime, not Jesus, not the Son of God. He came humbly into the world. And these shepherds who were really a bunch of lowlifes, as we heard this last week, just a bunch of nobodies, they are stunned at the angelic announcement. Hardly anybody understood what was going on. Do, do we really know what's going on in 2020? I mean, if I had a dollar... For every time somebody said, what is going on? What is going on? I don't even know fake news from real news. I don't know if, if this is going on or that's going on. Is that good? Is that bad? No different back then. Nobody knew what was going on here except for the Lord. And then we see Mary treasuring and pondering these things in her heart with great joy. And yet the visible Blue-collar shepherds, they only reinforced, reinforced the truth that the real Messiah would be a humble Messiah. The real Messiah would be a suffering servant king. A, a servant for you, for me. And he would enter into our pain. He would enter into that story with that backdrop. For Mary, shock must have come soon after the birth when she presented her newborn son in the temple. I don't know if you know that story, but on the eighth day, they would circumcise their, their young boys. And uh, on the eighth day, they went to circumcise Jesus in accordance with the covenant God made with uh, Israel in the Old Testament. She shows up at the temple to circumcise him as according to tradition and scripture. And an old man named Simeon comes to her. And Simeon had been waiting for this moment. He confirmed his sense that this was the Christ that God pointed to in the Old Testament. But then he turns to Mary and he says something very interesting to her. He looks Mary in the eye and he says a very sobering prophetic word to Mary. Behold, this child of yours is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword. So now he's turning to her. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, Mary. So that thoughts from many are revealed. Can you imagine after giving birth to your firstborn child, hearing that your soul is going to be pierced through with a, with a sword? No, this is supposed to be your pride and joy. This is supposed to be your, your, your all in all. You're going to give your whole life to this child. And then Simeon says, he's going to be a conqueror but your heart's going to be crushed before this is over. Your heart is going to be devastated before this is over, Mary. What? Simeon was telling her, there's going to be a lot of controversy surrounding your son. He's going to have a lot of enemies. You're going to have a lot of pain in this life. It's not going to be cupcakes and rainbows. And Mary, you as his mom, as his mother, and mothers feel deeply about their kids, a sword is going to pierce right through you, your soul. This could only mean that some tragedy was appointed for her son. Could her own soul be pierced by anything other than premature death? 
That's the hardest, hardest kind of death to live through is the death of your own child. Some women have had miscarriages and lost a child. Some have lost them a little bit older. Some get up to their older aged years and they lose a child. And, and when they are in their 70s and 80s and their kids are in their 50s and 60s and they're still devastated, you don't overcome that. You just get through it. Mary, it's going to happen that way. And then on top of that, you have the backdrop of Herod, King Herod and the slaughter. Most horrifically related to that first Christmas came one of the greater tragedies in all of the Bible, dozens of little infant boys, dozens of little boys and toddler boys who grew up to the age of two. They were going to be ripped from their parents' arms and they were going to be slaughtered by a tyrant. Slaughtered, that's the backdrop. Herod, King Herod, he was a nut job. Probably ran for office. Probably was a politician. Absolute nut job. Became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years and under, Matthew said. This was not the slaughter of the guilty. This was not the slaughter of the guilty as we, as we see in various ways throughout Scripture. But, but like Pharaoh who tossed those little babies in the river into the Nile, this was a slaughter of innocence. And what pain would come in the wake of that first Christmas? Again, commissioning an angel, God rescued his son from this slaughter to preserve him for a later and more horrific one. Think about that. Think about the sovereignty of God in that. He spares him only for a more horrific slaughter later on. God says on that first Christmas, I am not going to ignore your pain. I'm going to enter into it. I'm coming right into the middle of it. He does spare them. They get down to Egypt. They flee for a while, which was the grace of God. And according to Scripture and his plan, yet Mary's time, as prophesied, would come soon enough. The life that came into the world that first Christmas was not going to be an easy one. It was not going to be an easy one at birth. It was not going to be an easy one in his infancy. It was not going to be an easy one in Jesus' adulthood. In fact, the opening words of John's gospel capture a particular pang that would, would be true of Jesus' whole life. As John said in 1, 10 to 11, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Might as well be 2020. Might as well be right now. Isaiah had prophesied that the Christ would be despised and rejected, and he was, that he would be a, a man of sorrow, acquainted with much grief. Have you grieved this year over any kind of loss? Loss of a loved one, loss of innocence, loss of hope. Just loss after loss after loss. Jesus was acquainted with sorrow and grief, and indeed he was, according to Isaiah 53. But this life, as painful and as challenging as it would be, he is not going to ignore the pain. But he is going to enter into the pain as a man of sorrows, in order to bring you and me, called the church, deep, deep, satisfying joy. The great joy the angels pronounced that we saw last week in Luke 2, that first Christmas, that joy can sustain you. It can sustain you as it sustained Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the magi 
all with that dark backdrop of their day as well. Christmas, for those here, for those online, for those who will hear maybe one day this little devotional, Christmas doesn't ignore your pain. Doesn't ignore your pain. And neither does it bid you to wallow in it either. You know, Christians are some of the worst. We're some of the worst of beating ourselves up. Why would we do that? When the Christ entered into suffering for us, when the Christ purchased our salvation, Christmas takes both of those seriously, more seriously than any secular celebration can. You know, for most people who don't know or love Jesus, they're going to open their presents. They're going to be sad about what they didn't get. They're going to move on to the next trouble, the next trial, the next tribulation. They're going to wallow in their sin, pain, and misery, and they're going to look for their hope in something else. They're going to look for their hope in the next president. They're going to look for the next hope in the stimulus check. They're going to look for hope in the next house or car or relationship or marriage or children or grandchildren or what that person thinks of me or what that person thinks of me. And they're going to keep looking and looking and looking and they're never going to find it because they've missed the true meaning of Christmas. Christmas in this age doesn't guarantee Mary and Bright, not yet, but it does promise that merriness and brightness are breaking in. It promises that merriness and brightness are breaking in. And when the light shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot overcome it. It is an impossibility. It is an impossibility for the darkness to overcome the light can't comprehend it. A small flicker of a flame of light can light up a room. So what we have, this hope inside of us, it says, yes, merriness and brightness are breaking through. Christmas at its best gives us a peak of the uncompromised joy that is absolutely coming. God is not a liar. He never has lied. He never will lie. And the joy is coming. That's why he says joy is coming in the morning. It's on the way. It's already here. And his name starts with a J too, Jesus. It's on the way and we get a glimpse of it. That's why you love Christmas. As we heard last week, that's why you love the presents. Why do you wrap a present? Well, let's stretch the truth a little bit because it's not really that far off, right, as we heard in that message last week. Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. What a great surprise. Jesus hung on the cross like ornaments hang on a tree. Jesus hung on a tree like you put a tree up in your house. A tree is beautiful. Jesus is beautiful. Jesus is the light of the world. You light up your house with icicle lights, and then they pop and go out, and you put another one in, put a fuse in, you know, do the aluminum foil trick. Why? There's this common grace all over the world. Common grace all over the world with Christmas. Why? Because the light is real. And like the Apostle Paul and the man of sorrows himself, Jesus, we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. We're weird. We're just weird people. Christians are weird. Sorry. You can be sorrowful and absolutely joyful at the same time. No matter what sorrow you've gone through this year, you can also have great joy this year. And it only comes from Jesus Christ, the man of sorrows. We may be overwhelmingly sorrow, sorrowful at Christmas, and yet in Christ, by his Spirit, God may give us the wherewithal to rejoice. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to sing back to Jesus. 
We're going to meditate on the incarnation. That means putting on flesh of God who dwelt among us, who lived a life without sin, who died on the cross for the penalty and punishment for your sin. What greater joy is there than knowing that? You will not be held accountable for a single solitary sin having surrendered your life in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. What a thought that Jesus' righteousness, his perfect record of righteousness, will be credited to your account. Credited, full credit. Anybody got any credit card debt? Don't raise your hand. Anybody got any house or car debt, medical debt? Imagine Jesus stamping that thing out and saying, I'll pay it all. He did that with sin and judgment and overcame it at the resurrection. He was vindicated. So we can be sorrowful and joyful at the same time. And that may be exactly where you are in 2020, and that is just what the good Dr. Luke ordered for you for 2021. We don't know what's around the corner, but we know Jesus is waiting there for us. So let's stand together. We're going to sing back. We're going to kill the lights, all of them. We've done this so far, two or three. Is it the third Christmas now? Wow. And we're going to do it. This is COVID, COVID appropriate, I guess. COVID appropriate. We're going to turn on our lights on the phones. Don't want my young man here blowing COVID on me <laughs> with a candle. Just kidding. That's a bad joke. We're going to sing back to the Lord with our phones on and uh, rejoice. And thank you, Pastor Bill, for leading us and the worship team. And it is so good to just come and reflect on the goodness of God with you guys tonight. Let's sing back to the Lord.
so glad you decided to come out tonight and uh, just celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we do pray you have a wonderful Merry Christmas. We have one more 2020 uh, service this coming Sunday at 1030. And we'd love to have you. We're going to close out 2020 and uh, hopefully ring in 2021 in a big way, all for the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you'll, the Lord will keep you and bless you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. And you guys have a wonderful Merry Christmas. Drive home safely. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.